Newswatch Oklahoma, this special Tuesday night edition with Scott Mitchell and uh, my friend Storm Jones from the road, just having returned from on the way home from Texoma land. Storm, good to see you. I think I've got you muted, and I will try to make sure that I undo that here, or maybe I don't have you muted. That could be on your end, Mr. Jones. Hey, you here. got me. Hey, I just got to tell you, the package that you did, you did at 6 o'clock with the pastor of that church that was destroyed, some of the best work I've ever seen. Well, thank you. It just is heartbreaking uh, being down here because that church uh, was one of the largest buildings in the community, Kingston in Marshall County, and been there 50 years. The church itself was more or less just shredded, pulled apart, and the parsonage all but leveled. And the uh, preacher had been there 16 years. Uh, he and his wife were running down a hall to get to a bathroom when the roof came off the house last night around 6.30. So a lot of folks, similar stories like that. Unfortunately, I don't know if they had a great warning uh, down here in far southern Oklahoma, Lake Texoma. And uh, so a lot of folks heard it. Their first indication was they heard the roar, the growl. They all described that sound we've heard on television. And uh, they all say that's a real deal. It happened last night. That was... may have just a little bit of an interruption while we're waiting to get uh, storm back. Let me bring in Jeff Dismukes. We'll see if that, we can't pull that stream in because Jeff, of course, you see him every other week on uh, health watch, Oklahoma. And, um, there's also another story today that is, uh, equally heartbreaking, uh, from the Tishomingo area where six young girls were uh, killed in a car wreck. I'm going to take that picture out for just a second. I'll try to get that one back. But uh, Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, I mean, you've got grief counseling happening in, in the southern part of the state. People have lost homes. Churches have been impacted, all kinds of things like that. Um, and let me get this shot back in here. Stay with me, Jeff. Sure. We're, well, we're bringing him in. Oh, there he is. We're back. Hey. We got you live. Okay, good deal. I switched over devices. That's okay. You were right in the middle of talking about they just had enough time well, the, I don't know how much warning they had, but they were hearing the noises and boom, everything was gone. Yeah, no, that's it. That's what folks told us uh, time and time again as they heard that roar, that train sound that we've heard about on TV. And many of them just started heading towards their safe spot. Uh, a lot of folks down here in mobile homes, which we know is just awful. But the redeeming factor is that, you know, this is a largely a vacation spot for folks, a summertime weekend spot on the lake. So uh, most of them weren't home. So if they were, if all the homes we saw today were fully occupied, it, uh, it would have been much worse. We know at least 10 folks were transported to the hospital. A 73-year-old woman on the Texas side of the lake died. Uh, but that's the only known fatality so far uh, at this point. There were, uh, the governor was down there, but I saw the local officials who know most about what's happening on the ground down there. Any idea how many structures impacted at this point? They hadn't even began collecting, they maybe began collecting that, but they hadn't uh, reached that far of the assessment. It's, I mean, it would be dozens. I mean, it, we saw at least, you know, uh, 15 to 20 homes that were completely destroyed. I'm not talking about roof came, you know, a roof here, I'm talking, you're seeing the studs. Um, yeah, a lot of folks dealing dealing with that. But like I said, thankfully, most of these homes were exoma. There were boats thrown everywhere. We, I saw multiple, you know, boats. Well, I think we've lost that particular shot, but when you start talking about the aftermath of this, okay, Mr. Dismukes, there are going to be people who are grieving. And then as, as we were heading towards the other point I was about to make, which was the, the Tishomingo tragedy today, six young, we don't know a whole, whole lot of details, apparently students killed during the lunch hour, uh, in a collision with the semi truck, but you know, a community that size. It doesn't make any sense what community is. I mean, six young girls killed 
uh, in a town that size, it's going to, it's going to be devastating. Let me pull him back in here as well. But, um, you know, it's just one of those things. Now, where I was headed was the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. You have a network. You get involved in grief counseling and working with high schools. How does this work, Jeff? Well, as far as working with the high schools, we have uh, regular partnerships built with the high schools. And actually, in that eastern part of the state, we have a, a couple of special initiatives going where the school districts are working with local behavioral health providers, uh, different types of resources trying to to reach out, identify opportunity to engage with kids. Now, with this, uh, with an, uh, an instance like this, the community is able to kind of pull together and wrap around that district with all the different resources that are available. So it's not just going to be our providers uh, who are in the area, but I mentioned the health department's going to be engaged in other, other resources from that area. Uh, but we're able to, to reach out and we actually have teams that can, can work with the schools and develop a response uh to help reach out to all the students involved there in the community uh, parents are going to be impacted students are going to be impacted uh, all aspects of that community are going to be impacted by by something like this something so tragic uh and and it's going to take a while uh, to heal it's really important that uh we understand that these are processes that can take a little bit of time and, and to ensure that we're getting people linked to services not just today but but down the road when this really really starts to to hit home uh for instance with the tornadoes let's kind of move back to that and kind of the response there uh we typically are very involved in communities after after tragic events and unfortunately out of necessity oklahoma is considered a leader in our response to these crisis types of, of situations uh we've we've had the experience with it uh but it's also fortunate that we do have a plan together, an incredible team across the state that involves emergency management and multiple other agencies that kind of pull together and are able to come in and, and respond to that community with everything in need. I should remind any, everyone, the great way to find resources in the area is just simply to call 211. Uh, typically what will happen as we go through these, these instances, we will set up uh, response lines later in a couple of months, we'll have 988 in the state. But for right now, call 211 and you're able to link to a variety of resources, not just uh, grief counseling, but also you're able to link to other resources that will help with rebuilding and, and navigating uh, these, these situations. Our providers in the area right now uh, are available, but there will probably be a little more of a concerted effort in a week or so. Usually when these storms happen and, and these incidents happen, there's a lot of people that come in to help and, and the individuals impacted are, frankly, they're in survival mode. They're trying to, to go on with their lives and get things going. There's a lot of adrenaline that's happening at that point. It's later. It's when the TV cameras go away and all the help that comes into the community goes away and you're, you're left wondering what you're going to do. That's the time when it's really important uh, to link people to services and, and we'll be there just as, as we've been for other tragedies around the state. Uh, we're going to be there and we're going to be a resource for the community. Let me get bring Storm back in and uh, let's see if I've got his mic. All right, I've got, we've got you back here. Uh, Jeff was just talking about working with the communities. Do, what is tomorrow, from what you've seen today, what does tomorrow hold for the communities down there, Storm? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of, obviously a lot of just cleanup left. I think we may have a connection issue here. So I'm going to go ahead and take that shot down. I'll let him know here, I'll send him a note. But typically for people like you, Jeff, and your agencies, what's tomorrow hold? Well, it's going to be reaching out and communicating with the different providers that we have in the area, the different resources, taking an assessment. Uh, of what we have available and who it is that we need to be talking to. Uh, certainly we'll be uh, already uh, have been probably communicating. I haven't been in the office today, but I, I will assume just the, the way this typically works. We've already been in contact with emergency management. There are already plans in place uh, on how to respond, what, what resources to get together, reaching out to our grief counselors and figuring out how we we reroute and uh, push extra resources into those communities that are that are in need. 
Hey, I'd love you how much you could hear of that uh, storm about what's happening and with for the resources the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services works on. You were just talking when we lost the signal, which is basically the cleanup tomorrow. You, you suspect we'll see national media in here tomorrow? I don't know. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of um, folks in Texas dealing with similar stuff, uh, similar tornadoes down there. Um, I, I don't know on the media side, but I'll tell you one moment that was personal to me today was, you know, there's just a field of debris, like uh, stuff, stuff just uh, scattered everywhere that I'm walking across. And there are folks picking up photos and stuff that kind of cleared out. And I noticed um, a piece of paper that looked like it had a seal on it. And I noticed the gentleman's name who I just interviewed, his name was on it. So I picked it up and I took it to his son and I said, I'm not sure what this is, but it has your dad's name on it. And so I gave it to him and I was, I walked away and he said, Hey, Storm. And he said, that was my birth certificate. Holy So it's Moses. things like wow. that, that is yeah. these, these documents people are going to have to start, you know, not only figuring out where they're going to live, but their social security card, their their birth certificate, all that stuff they may not have right now. So that just adds on to the right now problems. And then there's problems that they're going to have for a long time trying to get their lives back in order with this type of stuff as well. Hey, it's a tight knit community. I mean, I've spent a lot of summers in Buncombe Creek. We had a Lindsay boy. There were a lot. There were Lindsay families had places there. I still have friends who have places down there. By the way, my friend Phil Mil Phil Maytubby, City County Department of Health. I asked him. He has a place down there. It was five miles away, but his brother has a place in Buncombe Creek. He got away okay. His place did, but a tremendous amount of uh, disaster down there. And the first day of spring. I mean, we've been pretty. Good. We've been had a lot of luck the last few years in Oklahoma with tornadoes, but. Well, and that's the other thing is we talk about all the time. People want to know if Tornado Alley has shifted. Maybe they're more predominant in certain places and whatnot. But for the folks in these communities right now, I mean, it doesn't matter. It takes one tornado to upend folks' lives. And that's why I think we take it so seriously around this part of the country is, you know, maybe they come and go, but at the end of the day, you know, you want to, you want to be on top of them. You want to take them seriously every time there's a chance for this type of stuff to happen. And, uh, you know, preparation's important, but now, you know, it kind of shifts to, to rebuilding down here in southern Oklahoma. Have you guys seen, and I'm like, now it's like we're at the barbershop. Okay. Have you guys seen the video of the truck getting blown over and yeah. on its side spinning and they, it pops up and there was a, a video while it goes, uh, he was driving away. Somebody had the picture and he's driving away. Like, you know, hey, this happens every day down here. You get flipped over, you spin on your side, you pop back up and you drive off down the road. Now, how's that for Oklahoma? That's got to be a Chevy commercial. It's got, you know, that, that truck uh, just went through the tornado, did the twirl, uh, twirl and it kept going. But that's another thing that uh, just the destruction today that was so crazy is that, you know, a lady was showing me her tree with uh, her bird feeders were still on, still hanging on the tree, still had seed in them. The tree right next to it was uprooted and landed on her house. So the hit and miss nature. I think we may have uh, lost him again, but while we may have lost storm and guess who we've gained, there we go. I mean, it's, we've traded hey Augusta there. for storm. We've had pretty good stream. Hi to you both. Hi to Hi. you. This is a good, uh, good connection here. We just lost storm. We got some great reports. He had some great stories. Yours was uh, great as well today. What stood out in your mind, Augusta? Sure. Today, um, I guess what really stood out to me is so the, the, the people that I talked to today, actually, I had a great story today. She was an, uh, I met an EMT from Norman who happened to be vacationing in the community. And I think the thing that stood out to me most was how much worse this could have been. Um, I guess even last week, there were hundreds of people at the Buncombe Creek Marina that was smashed, which is where I spent most of the day with DJ. Um, there were like hundreds of people in that RV park. And today, last night, there was just one RV there. And from that, they pulled a woman from that RV who was severely injured. So, you know, just in cruising around Buncombe Creek today, you know, met up with this group. She, they actually sent me some kind of crazy video. They, they kind of emerged from their mobile home and kind of realize that it had been they didn't see that it was a tornado i think the thing that's striking is some people are watching you know they're watching the forecast 
but it was a rain wrapped tornado. And so they didn't know it was going to happen. Like they knew it was coming, but it's not like, I don't know. I guess they, they, they closed the door. Like at the last second in this group that I talked to from Midwest city, they're just down there for a vacation. Um, so I think the suddenness of this, I think it was a surprise in some ways. And I think it's very fortunate that there weren't more people down there because this could have been, I mean, there was several mobile homes completely smashed, completely destroyed. I mean, it's a vacation home. These are light homes. They're like kind of mobile homes or, or cinder block or steel. Or I mean, these are light homes. These aren't like the brick community. What she's talking about is even people have uh, trailers that we see in more. And, uh, so I think it could have been a lot worse. Is really, yeah. RVs, do you got me? Do you got me now? So sorry. Storm and I are both driving north. We're just, yeah, we're we're just a little bit north of Ardmore, but if you lose me, okay, great. So, um, so that anyway, that's what really struck me today was it's kind of a, a, it's a vacation area. So these aren't big brick homes, you know what I mean? Um, but the woman I met today, Kylie Sterling, an EMT from Norman, who because she was on News 9 will now have to buy ice cream for all of her peers at MSTAT in Norman. <laughs> Um, literally she's a mom. She like, they, they left, you know, they emerged from the mobile home. They saw debris on the ground and they heard cries for help. And there was two boys and a mom in a tipped over trailer. And she literally, she's this little woman. Kylie was what? Probably five, two. Yeah. Five, two, a buck five. And she, you know, ran over, smashed the window of this trailer. She was with a couple people. They pulled this family out. She's patching them up with gauze from her car because in that area, it takes so long for emergency personnel to even get there. Plus there's debris all over the road. There was trees down everywhere. So I think it was just a blessing, blessing that in, for the few people who were injured right in her area that she was there. And then she also, you know, they went down to this RV, like I was saying, that was smashed at the marina and they, they pulled a woman out who was severely injured. She said she had a bag of gauze in her car that was a gift from when she became an EMT nine years ago. And I just sat in her car for nine years. She never used these supplies, used them all yesterday. She patched up this woman and then they put her on a mattress, dragged her out of the RV into a truck, put her on the back of a truck and then drove her to meet the ambulance. Because, I mean, they had some very desperate moments. And I just think it is lucky that it was not worse. Yeah. When we were, when you were breaking up just a bit, we just started saying that, so it's, you, and you'd hit on it, vacation homes, a lot of trailers, okay? Yep. And people pull yeah. travel trailers down in there, and they've got totally. lot, lot of dwellings down there. So you're right, it could have been worse. We're talking another 60 days. You've got it much, much worse. That's the thing. I mean, yeah, we are just at the beginning of the season. So, um, you know, a couple of people I talked to were just like, you know, if David Payne or somebody tells you to be careful or to shelter or, you know, to get into your, your safe room, just do it because you don't know what's going to happen. And I think this wasn't, they knew there was going to be a storm, but this was really bad. And I think it was a little bit of surprise to some people. Well, it wasn't a pain because I will tell you this the oh, day no, before, either. I mean, right. these people were saying, I, I know because I'm watching nine, but I, David was saying the day before, we think most of this will be right south of the red river in Southern Oklahoma. Yeah. And you could not mm -hmm. be more spot on yeah. 24 hours before. So that was, you know, your sense of, of, um, of hazard is heightened when somebody says it's, you know, it's another state away, but people, North Texas, obviously yeah. Austin area got hammered up through yep. there this is it's, it's an outlier and it's just weird um sure what your I, thoughts about uh, what's in store for the people of uh, buncombe creek tomorrow you know they're cleaning up they're trying to get the power on and i think it's just gonna it's gonna take a long time to clean up and i wouldn't you know i mean some of these homes are mobile homes that have been there for decades and so and from what it's from just from chatting with people today and, and storm kind of heard the same thing he said in his story there's a lot of these properties that aren't insured so it'll be interesting to see how this disaster affects the community um the governor didn't declare a state of emergency or a, or a disaster which in some ways you know uh releases some funding so i'm not quite sure what funding will be available for these folks but those factors are um, you know, worth keeping in mind. So if you see an opportunity to donate to this community through, you know, to Kingston or Little City, which is 
that small community just northeast of Kingston. That was just, I mean, these three communities just right on the path of that tornado coming out of North Texas. Um, any of them could use your support. I mean, if you see it, you know, the Red Cross or some, you know, a credible organization, I think they're going to need some support. And I think it's worth noting that this was an EF2 tornado. That is not a big tornado. I mean, it is, but like in the sense that the, how much damage it caused to like homes and structures, I think it's just a reminder to be like super mindful of the structure that you're in, you know, RVs and mobile homes, some did, but there were some that were just totally smashed by this EF2 tornado. So, you know, the strength of your structure is definitely a factor. And if there's a, um, there's a storm shelter and there was a storm shelter in this community in the church, you know, it's really important to, to go seek that shelter if you're in a, you know, a, a less secure building. Here's what I want to do. I, have you seen the video of the, of the pickup being spun yes. around? Wild. I want to find that dude. All right. I really want to talk to this guy because number one, he's cool as the other side of the pillar. Okay. Oh, because yeah. he's just, driving off, you know, just like another day at the office. So if, I mean, if, if our viewers know this guy, if you recognize him, I really want to talk to him. Yeah. Definitely. First off, I don't know what brand he was driving, but there's some motor uh, manufacturing company, Ford, Dodge, Toyota, yes. Chevy that want to talk to him too. Okay, oh, because yeah. if that's not a commercial for a pickup truck, I don't know what is, right? <laughs> I mean, now that's a deal right there. Right? You're going to get yourself, they're going to be throwing more money at this guy than Ford did Toby Keith. I mean, that oh. was, that's, oh, yeah. That's a good story right that there. Truck. That's a great story. I mean, but like, what would you do if that was you? I guess you would just keep driving. Like, I, I can't imagine what was going through his head. Go to the car wash. Video clean it out that's what you'd be doing yeah right? like he was just i mean obviously i had a seatbelt on i don't know yeah that was a wild video well you got to find some humor and tragedy and that and he's lucky you're not Truly. supposed to be in vehicles in the middle of tornadoes okay we've known that's forever and forever. those yeah. end badly I think back to the yeah. storm chasers back the arena i mean you, being in a vehicle in a tornado is usually a bad ending so anyway that's going to be you'll be talking about that one for a long time uh, yeah. What time did uh, both crews head out this morning, by the way? Oh, gosh. Storm Storm headed out earlier. He probably got there an hour before us, and we left uh, Storm and Mauricio. He's been a photographer, Mauricio. Um, he did probably left an hour before us. We left at 9.30, We left at 9.30, so, Oh, okay. So it's been a long day. Yeah, but but not too bad, um, and we'll be back by 9. So, yeah, it's about a two, okay. two and a half hour drive. We'll be careful on the way back. It's that late in the day. Thank you. Great job to uh, both of y'all. And uh, the photojournalism was great. Our, our it was, the, yep. you told stories today, okay? And they were yes. moving stories and people could see with their own eyes. And, and I think that's the thing that photojournalism does, okay? Is it when we, we can hear and we can read these stories, but when you see them, you feel them. Truly. Truly. That's the difference. That's the difference. Augusta McDonald's somewhere on the road, headed back to OKC. Drive carefully. Yeah. Thanks to you, and we'll see you again thank soon. You. Bye. Thank right. you. Bye-bye now. Well, wow. It's amazing. Yeah, the, the stories were great, and uh, it kind of really brings us. It, it hits home, and it's telling us something also, I think, with all the storms that we had through the winter, and now first day of spring, we have this coming. Uh, we need to be aware. And what is it that they're always saying? Be weather aware. Uh, definitely yeah. this spring. We need to to keep our ears up. Taught me a couple of things. I know I'm not going to be driving into a storm also. So see that truck, that hey, truck spinning f- around. Can you stay with us for a few more minutes? Sure. Okay. Stand by. I want to bring in our next guest, Representative Dale Krebs, out there at the captain. So it's deadline week. All right. And, uh, and we were just talking that Jeff has been trying to get a driver's license for 275 <laughs> days in a row. And uh, I suppose we're, this is kind of a victory lap for you, Representative uh, Curbs. You're, you've you got a bill off of Florida tonight that all people are going to be interested in, right? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, and I can tell you that it's going to take you less than 270 days to go ahead and get your license as we move forward in this. So, you you know, Jeff, you're going to be successful there. Now, uh, the house, it's House Bill 3419. And there's also a uh, Senate bill as well. That's a mirror bill on there. Both of those have moved off of the respective floors and they'll make the transition and work through. Uh, what it is, is taking the two agencies that handle tag agencies 
and the driver's license issues, which is in DPS, and the tag and title issues, which are done in OTC, bringing both of those divisions that are under those agencies under one roof, combining consolidation, better service, working towards a service Oklahoma model so that uh, that when you call, when uh, our agents, our tag agents are calling in, that they actually get the help that they need to take care of the constituents and Oklahomans that are there getting their driver's license and things along that line taken care of right then instead of having to wait. Now, keep in mind, we've had the perfect storm and you've heard it many, many times before. Real ID uh, implementation came in play right as COVID hit, hit the state in, back in 2020. So everything, we got everything ready to go. Everything shut down, uh, you know, and then we tried to bring it back up. The backlog is tremendous. We still have a backlog. Our tag agents, don't yell at them. It's not their fault. It's just the perfect storm. Uh, as we bring through that and bring up a new computer system, we all know how new computer systems operate, not the way they sold us the bill of goods. Let's just be honest. We buy a great computer. We expect it to run perfectly. We're going to have problems. So we're working through all of those. Now, now it's time that we've, we, we've seen that we've got some issues here at the state level. So let's put all those ducks in the right line, in the right order, and get the service that we've come to expect over the years back out there in the field. And that's what this bill will do once it moves across the Senate floor, goes to the governor, gets signed. The timeline is, is the uh, DL services, which are DPS, uh, come online under Service Oklahoma on November of this year. And then January of next year will be the tag and title uh, component of there. And let's get those started, get everybody caught up. We are still looking at a deadline of May 2023 for Real ID compliant for the state of Oklahoma. So don't wait till the last minute for to, you know, to go out and get your driver's license renewed. If you are within a year of the renewal, go ahead and call your tag agent, get that appointment scheduled or go down and get that thing started now because we still have a backlog. There are many people out there that need to get these things taken care of. But one of the good things that we did last session uh, was go ahead and take where you can now get an eight-year license instead of just a four-year renewal, an eight-year to help that along. So we're working on it. We know it's a horrible process out there trying to get through that. And most frustration, we already had to spend time there just for the for the for the situation beforehand, all of that piled on top of it caused the deadline, the delays, 272 days as we joke about. We're going to get that whittled down. It's already starting to work. Everything's starting to go into play. Just be patient and don't wait till the last minute. And by the way, if you have to wait the last minute, go to Luther Tag Agency. Those are boots are ours out here in Eastern Oklahoma County did a great, great job, but well, they did a great job during that. So I got my real ID and when they did the super center down there in the old health department building, yep, so I yep. didn't know, I, I didn't know something that could be done that well. Yeah, that, yes. I, I will have to say, we understand the mess represented curbs and, and colleagues trying to clean this sort of thing up, but that, that super center deal, and I'm sure you knew more about it than, than us representative that worked pretty well. I, I was really, really impressed with how that worked. And those were great people and patient people I mean, everybody, when everybody's upset about something like this, but just everybody was cool and it, and we got it done. The whole family got out of here early. We didn't wait around, but I got to tell you, that was pretty nice. And this is one of those, I think people talk about state reps and state senators and, and you see all the headlines. This is the sort of stuff representative curbs that people don't really get about the, this is not the headline grabbing stuff that you folks do, right? That's exactly right. We, we had a working group of 14 legislators, seven on the House side, seven on the Senate, that worked all summer long. We actually started this process well over a year ago. We also worked with a, a working group of tag agents, existing tag agents, to make sure that we were doing what we need to do with the front line and, and keep that all cohesive and working together. And what we came up with was the bills we affectionately call those bills Big Bertha because they're 760 plus pages long. Uh, you know, so trying to get through all of that, work through it. It's a good process. It's definitely a good starting point 
We've still got processes to go, but let's take it one step at a time instead of trying to eat this cake as a whole piece, you know, all at one bite. We've been putting Band-Aids on this system for years, and uh, the Band-Aids just are not fixing the problem. So it's time that we actually do some serious reform and consolidation and make sure that this system works the way that we want it to, the way it needs to, and so all Oklahomans can be serviced in their area without having to go. You mentioned those mega centers. We ran those mega centers both in Oklahoma City and Tulsa for right at, right at six months on each one of them. They were great. They definitely helped, um, but they didn't you know, take care of the entire backlog. And we only had authorization from the legislative body to run those for that six month time frame. Uh, we are looking at some smaller it, uh, divisions of that that's going to work with the existing tag agents. We're in that process right now to bring more uh, DL services. If they've got one IDEMIA camera system, uh, how many can they handle with the staff that they have or what do we need to do to train up? Uh, we all know that workforce right now is at a premium. So one, trying to find the workforce and get them trained so that we can get more of these uh, camera systems into these tag agencies is a challenge. Uh, so as we work through that, I just ask that everybody be patient, but we are well on our way to a better tomorrow uh, with this bill plus with the people working for. And at the end of the day, your tag agents, everybody, it's Oklahomans working to make Oklahoman life better. And that's our goal. You know, half the battle on this is like, uh having confidence in somebody to lead on an issue. I'm ready to charge up a hill behind you, Representative Curbs. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Uh, sometimes it feels like the, it was a pretty big hill, but, you know, when we have that team together all the way around and everybody uh, working together, the beautiful thing about it, and, and you'll know this as well as any, if I can get two state agencies, uh, a private par private public partnership, and the legislative body, not only in the same chapter, but on the same page, we have a miracle in the making. That's exactly right. <laughs> also, I've learned over the years, when you get leadership involved in a deal, it's kind of like that old scene with Buford T. Justice, where that a boot, you know, hits them and they go, that's an attention getter. And that's I know you exactly guys right. have been working on an attention getter on this deal. And I, again, you just like to see some aggressive leadership to go grab a problem. That would, when I would stand in line with folks at, at Luther Tag or down at those uh, super centers, you know, it was mostly folks going, just want to see it get resolved. You know, people are, everybody's put out by this, but I know people are going to be overjoyed that there's a plan and that somebody's leading the way. And I, we salute you, Representative. Well, I appreciate that. Like I said, that's just the start. The great part about this whole thing is uh, we've talked to several state agencies that uh, deal with, uh, systems that they need to deal with the constituency. And, uh, you know, let's just take a birth certificate, state issued birth certificate. There's times we lose them. There's times we need them. Tragedy happens, whatever that case, including death certificates. Wouldn't it be nice instead of having to call up the state agency here at 23rd and Lincoln and say, hey, I need to do that. It's going to be a two week process or get a voice line to be able to go to your service, Oklahoma local agent and be able to get that service taken care of, same day service, or within a, you know, within a couple of days, worst case scenario. That's the end goal. This is a long-term plan to take care of Oklahomans and get the services they need from the state at a local level. So imagine Service Oklahoma, uh, we, we talk about it as the McDonald's. If you're in Luther and you want to get a cheeseburger at that McDonald's, but you have to go to Guyman, you expect that cheeseburger that you like to be at the McDonald's in Guyman. Same thing with the service Oklahoma. The services that you can get in Luther, you can get in Guyman or LaFleur County or anywhere in the state. And that's the end goal. And we're going to keep working at it until we get to that, get that accomplishment made. And this is that big first step to do it. It sure is. And it always helps whenever that somebody who's leading this has the name chairman in front of their name. <laughs> Well, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it does not hurt, which means that uh, they're, you're the big man on campus in that particular uh, uh, committee that gets things done. And bureaucrats listen to people whose first name is chairman or chairwoman. They tend to listen to that. And uh, 
by the way, is it your hometown, which is not now you were born Ponca City, but you're Shawnee guy now, right? That is correct. That is correct. Uh, you know, we I've called Shawnee my home since '96. Uh, we left for a little while uh, for a couple of years, but when we decided it was time to have Gibbs, we came back, and that's been our home base for for there on out. And I run a wonderful. I'm gonna give a shameless plug. I run a wonderful restaurant called the Coney Island. You ought to come down. We'll have some conies, have some good time right there. <laughs> oh, I did not know this. This is good information I have because I know that, uh, you know, one of the things my wife tries to do is keep me away from hot dogs. But when there's a good reason, now I've got a good reason. Absolutely. So. And, you know, uh, you never trust a skinny cook. And you can tell by the picture I'm not skinny. So let's <laughs> let's put down some conies. <laughs> hey, we, we, this is a triple header right here for that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Representative Kerbs, Mr. Chairman, thanks for all you're doing on this. This is great news. And by the way, I use another food analogy. I mean, this is those sort of meat and potatoes work that the legislature does. And, uh, you know, having been from a family of one who was there for 20 years, who also was A and B chair, last Democrat, by the way, I was with him yesterday. You know, you, there are the things that don't, these don't get in the press. With these sorts of stories usually don't get the headlines. So you, the headlines go to the PR bills, right? This right. sort of stuff. You've been working on this for years to get this done, and you're almost to the finish line. As you say, when you get to the finish line, you're just at the start. So we salute you. And there will be a lot of people that are going to enjoy the work, the fruit of your labor on this, Representative Kerbs, who will never know what you did, and the, and the members, people who voted for it, and the people that are going to implement your leadership. And um, shout out to House and Senate leadership on getting this done. We appreciate you. Well, we sure appreciate it. And at the end of the day, that's what the good part about it is, is getting the job done. Who cares who the credit is, but we get it done and make Oklahoma a better place for all Oklahomans. I got one quick question before yep. I let you go. Your ag committee, correct? Yep. You're seeing what's happening over uh, across the pond over in Ukraine. We know that that's one of the, that's the world's breadbasket. I mean, those farmers in Ukraine, you know, they're, there are more tractors in Ukraine than I think in all of North America. It is an amazing place. They raise a lot of wheat. You're watching what's happening on the world market. And for Oklahoma farmers and producers here, what's most concerning you right now? Well, you know, I got to give it up first thing to the Ukraine farmers and said, you talk about somebody knows how to run a tractor. When you can run a tractor and shut down Russian tanks, you know what you're doing. That's the first thing to start with. So i got to give it up to them on that market. It, it is going to be a challenge, uh, you know, more so uh, in the European and the UK than here. Uh, we are going to have some issues. Uh, we are keeping a close look on that. Uh, UK has already reached out to our secretary of ag uh, and, and talking about uh, what we need to do and moving forward and trying to help in ways that we can with them. Um, so we're just keeping a real close eye on that right now. And, and as we move forward, I'm sure we'll see more come up in the next few weeks. You might be able to trade a gallon of gas for a slice of bread in Eastern Europe right now. I mean, that's, it's probably going to be worth more for a slice of bread. And, and once again, to the people that uh, feed our nation and our world, we just cannot, we don't think about them until things like this. Right? Exactly. Absolutely. And we, we, more now than anywhere else, we want to know what, where our food comes from. And I can tell you, we have some of the best producers in the state of Oklahoma. And if you ever want to, I'll put, I'll put our ribeye steak up against anybody in the country. And uh, I promise you, you'll pick an Oklahoma certified beef or an Oklahoma certified meat product. And we better throw some potato and some sweet corn. And don't forget that watermelon over in Rush Springs. <laughs> I absolutely won't. That makes so, a good meal for the day. It does. I do have one quick question for you, which is this. What kind of um, kind of dogs in Coley, Coney Islander dogs do you have? Can, is, that, is that a trade secret? No, actually, uh, very proud to say that we are an MIO restaurant. Uh, we actually use Swab's hot dogs, and they're a custom hot dog that Swab does. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, uh, one of the best things they are, they're hickory smoked. So you add that with a nice layer of chili, put your little mustard on there, put you some of that nice sharp cheddar cheese, finely shredded, by the way, and don't forget that white onion. We'll tear us up some. Oh, man. 
tell you. I think <laughs> we need to go on location. <laughs> We're downtown. Well, down. You come on down. We'll 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 have a blast. I got one just for you, Scott. It's called the Fat Boy Special. Comes with four counties. Oh my them. goodness. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm down for a Fat Boy Special. So. <laughs> Well, listen, we really appreciate it. Thanks for taking time tonight. I know you're working. You guys going to work late, I'm sure, on other things tonight. But uh, Representative Dale Kerbs, who's the chairman of Ag and Rural Development, and uh, putting a stop to the nightmare, or it's a headache. I guess what's happening in Ukraine is a nightmare. This is a headache, and um, but a big headache for a lot of folks. And we really appreciate what you've done. Have a it's great a evening. With, it's a challenge, and we're going to overcome it. All right. Thanks so much. Thank we'll you see you guys. again. We'll be coming back again soon. Sounds good. All right. Good night. Okay. Well, that was enjoyable. I got it. That was. You. I'm going to Shawnee next week for Health Watch Oklahoma. I am from Coney Islander. I'm coming in from Coney Island. Okay. I'm, I think I need to go with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, any last thought? I, we're down to, uh, in just a moment, we're going to play this week's exclusive interview with uh, Speaker McCall, who's going to be talking about uh, election integrity and things that are happening at the Capitol. But before we let you go, Jeff, anything that's else that you wanted to talk about, we kind of found a moment of levity, but back to where we started the yeah. show, we've got, or the stream rather, we've got the tragedy in Southern Oklahoma down in the Tishomingo area. Uh, we have people feeling the stressors right now and some grieving families. Your advice to people that are, even if you're just seeing this from afar and you're stressed, uh, give us some, give us some understanding about what we should, what we should do if we feel that. So anytime you have any thoughts, uh, you know, a lot of times people ask questions. When do I know that I need to talk to somebody? Look, anytime you start thinking that maybe something's up, talk to somebody. It's not going to hurt. And there are easy ways to do that. You can call 211 uh, from anywhere in Oklahoma. Get linked to services in your area. If you are really feeling stress, if you kind of moving into a crisis um, moment, 800 Two seven three eight two five five. It's National Crisis Line. It's actually answered here in Oklahoma. So eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. Call it. Uh, there's special line for veterans, and there's a prompt that can be hit if it's a veteran. Uh, but you're going to end up talking to to someone who can help. Uh, has heard it before, uh, and it's going to know what to do as far as getting you linked to the right resources. It might not be that you necessarily need to have services. You just need someone to talk to. Uh, those folks are, that are uh, answering that line, they're trained to do that, uh, and they're going to be able to help. And there are a lot of different things that happen, a lot of stressors we've been going through for the last couple of years. We've come out of COVID. We have the stuff going on now with Ukraine. All of this is, is having an impact on us. It's storm season in Oklahoma. We've already had several storms that, that have caused damage and caused a lot of worry uh, across our state through the winter and, and up until now. Um, it's important. Step back, take care of yourself, do what you need to do, uh, to make sure that, that you're well, that your family's safe. Uh, and, and like I said, there are a lot of people out there, people like the folks at our department, uh, and other agencies throughout the state. That's what we're there for, uh, utilize those resources that we have. All right. Thanks for joining us tonight. Unannounced. I was going to bother you, but the things that were happening, I know you had a long day. I'm glad to have your contribution as always. Whenever we're dealing with some tragedies and, and issues that are on people's minds. Always, always appreciate you uh, asking us to come on and talk. All right. And we'll see you a week from tomorrow night. Absolutely. Um, Looking forward to it. We'll look forward to that. All right, Jeff, have a great evening. You too. Thanks. Thank you. All right. And saving the best for last, here's our weekly exclusive interview with House Speaker Charles McCall about what they're facing this week in the legislature. Hello again. It's time for our weekly visit with... House Speaker Charles McCall and Mr. Speaker, good to see you. Uh, all your morning, folks Scott. safe down in Southeast Oklahoma? Yes, they are. Uh, now we've uh, had some district neighbors down the southern part of the state that experienced some uh, some uh, wind damage uh, due to some tornadic act activity last night. But um, uh, all uh, communication and word this morning is that there were no fatalities, but there's some damage to property and there were uh, maybe a few injuries, but um, we are continuing to, to assess that situation. First day of spring comes in with a bang. Also, right. this is deadline week. And that's always, uh, historically, that's always an interesting time for your administration. And you've now been renominated for a, a fourth term. But in the, the three terms you've had as speaker, 
are these amongst the most interesting times uh, as being speaker and, and and trying to get the people's work done? Yeah, the deadline week is going to be really high high level of intensity and, and workload. Um, so far, uh, we had a great day yesterday. Um, we had a, you know a few bills that took up a you know significant amount of time, but uh, but the house is uh, moving through those those measures, knowing that this week they have to um, they have to advance uh, all all those measures that originated in the House uh, this session to, to meet the deadline for them to be considered in the Senate. And Senate's doing the same thing, um, but it's, it is a busy week and everyone is uh, prepared to, uh, to work, work some, some long hours this week. One of the issues that you're going to be taking up and, and taking a real hard look at is election integrity. Give us an understanding how this all fits into what's been happening nationally, Oklahoma has got a great system. Uh, most experts agree, but you're taking additional measures. So what is election integrity? What does that mean to the House and what are the, the legislation that you're looking at right now? Scott, we've, uh, we are blessed in Oklahoma that we have uh, taken this issue of election integrity serious for a number of years. You know, some of the states that have uh, tried to um, have, have tried to uh, strengthen um, their voting laws and to ensure fair contests that have taken a lot of, of uh, criticism and, and received a lot of national attention on those measures. Oklahoma has had those in place for, for a number of years. But we always uh, take election integrity very seriously. It's something that we, we always um, uh, take a look to see if we can improve uh, our integrity here in the state of Oklahoma. Because at the end, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter which contest that you're you're talking about when the when the um, election contest is over, you know uh, you want to you want to be uh, very sure that it was a fair and accurate contest and and so uh, and and that um, you know allows us to to remain functional in this state. Um, so we are once again uh, we take a look at that as one of our priorities this year. And we and we have advanced some bills already. Um, over to the Senate in this uh, in this arena, from uh, really focusing on initiative petition reform, um, our state's constitution being the uh, being the forty sixth state of the union, we have a very modernized con constitution in comparison to other states, which makes it very very lengthy. But one of those one of those um, uh, very modern ideas, uh, respectively. Uh, with the other states is the people's ability to advance uh, set law themselves through initiative petition, which is a great mechanism. Um, however, over the last few years, we have seen some out-of-state groups uh, exploit um, our constitution and in terms of being able to uh, very easily get uh, things on, uh, on the ballot and fund uh, campaigns to, to get those things passed. And we just want to make sure that the people of Oklahoma maintain that opportunity uh, with that mechanism and um, but but tighten it up where they, they cannot be exploited by out-of-state interests. Um, beyond that, uh, we're talking with uh, we're talking with the election board uh, and the election board secretary to to ensure that you know the people who are on the rolls here in Oklahoma to vote um, are are uh, qualified and valid under the law, and making sure that those voting lists are clean, and and that so once again, ultimately, it's it's all about when uh, you have a an election or a political contest in the state that when when the contest is over, people have uh, full faith uh, and trust in our process, and that the the outcomes are are what they are. In recent history, some ballot measures have proven to be really problematic, and everybody knows where I'm going with this. The medical marijuana petition, which just barely survived, but yet is created, and the voters voted for it. But the mm -hmm. way it was constructed has caused enormous, enormous problems for the tax commission, for law enforcement, all those sorts of things. Is this the sort of thing that the legislature is looking at and trying to modernize? Well, those are, you know, it's always up to the people of the state of Oklahoma. The legislature is not seeking to take away that mechanism uh, for the people because the people ought to, there should be accountability with their elected officials. And uh, while we're up here to do, to do their work, there should always be a mechanism uh, 
uh, for the people to to uh, take uh, laws, you know, directly to to a vote of themselves or um, a referendum on laws that the legislature has passed. But once again, you just um, you want to make you want to ensure that people understand the state questions uh, through these initiative petitions. Uh, medical marijuana for the state of Oklahoma, unless you really read the petition and studied it that was filed with the Secretary of State, you really don't know, uh, you really didn't know what you were voting for, quite honestly. Uh, the campaign dollars behind those um, measures are always going to, uh, they're always going to emphasize the good things um, in terms of revenues for education, et cetera, et cetera, but they, they very rarely talk about the the uh, implications on on society and on the people who are going to live here in the state of Oklahoma. So yes, we know, and and there's and there's two different hurdles in a uh, with initiative petitions. There are statutory measures that will become statutory law, um, and those that would go into the Constitution. One of the things that are we're contemplating this year, and we will have to send this to a vote of the people. The legislature cannot do cannot. Um, make a change on their own. We'll have to send it to a vote of the people, but we are going to, uh, we're wanting to send to a vote of the people, you know, anything that's going into our state's constitution, a higher threshold of, of approval um, is being discussed. Um, once again, something that goes into the state's constitution by a vote of the people cannot ever be changed, uh, but for another vote by the people of the state of Oklahoma. Statutory questions can be modified and amended um, as we go down the road um, through the le through legislative activity, although the legislature is always going to be very, very careful and conservative um, in those uh, efforts because it was passed by the, the state of Oklahoma. Um, but these are some things that we think should be considered um, by the people just to, to maintain the integrity of of, um, of our election laws and in, in our in the initiative petition area. And and so that once again, that's not not the only area that we're focusing on in, in election integrity this year. But that's that is uh, we are looking at initiative petition, and we're also looking to make sure that um, direct election contests are are fair and uh, transparent and secure. Sounds like some incredible debate we're going to be hearing, Mr. Speaker. Hope you uh, get plenty of sleep and stay hydrated for deadline week. It's going to be a challenging one. Well, it's, it's fine. We're we're all prepared, and and uh, so it'll be a productive week, I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Have a great week. Thank you, Scott. Okay, so thanks to all of our guests tonight: uh, Storm Jones and Augusta McDonald on the road from down around uh, Lake Texoma. I was just reading some notes from some friends, some places. I'm pretty sure that Candace and I've stayed over the years. They're gone down around the Buncom Creek area, and so we're. Our prayers for those folks tonight. And of course, we'll see what um, the next day story from Tisha Mingo, an incredible, incredible tragedy. Uh, thanks to Representative Curbs uh, and Jeff Dismukes. We really appreciate that. It's going to be interesting, by the way, the issue on, on ballot. I think they don't like to do seeing you around uh, 7 p.m. Thanks for all the folks who have written in tonight. Kit, Joanna, Larry, always good to see you. And we'll see you tomorrow night on the Health Watch Oklahoma with Dr. Larry Bookman. Have a great evening, everyone.